Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm Jen Barty in Washington. Today is Friday, April 21st, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Fierce fighting in Sudan's capital, Khartoum, and other cities creates a miserable situation for civilians. Actually, the situation in Sudan now, in Khartoum especially, is uh, very miserable. So the, the people, of civilians, are not feeling safe inside Khartoum these days. South Sudan says fighting in Sudan is affecting its oil production. Why is Burundi's government looking for former Prime Minister Alain Gion Boyani? Liberian mothers rally to prevent drug use among youths. Leaders call for climate protection for developing countries as the world celebrates Earth Day tomorrow, Saturday. That is why we must speed up efforts to deliver climate justice and scale up finance and capacities for adaptation and loss and damage. And drought threatens the livelihood of fishermen in Madame Ramfa, Niger. Those stories plus something O'Malley's course are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Fierce fighting between the Sudanese army and the rapid support forces continue Thursday in Sudan's capital Khartoum and other cities despite international calls, including by UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, for a cessation of hostilities. One account said more than 300 people had been killed and over 3,000 injured. The Pentagon said Thursday the U.S. was making contingency plans to facilitate the evacuation of U.S. embassy personnel from Sudan if necessary. Mohamed Adwa is in the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. He tells me what the situation is like for civilians. Actually, the situation in Sudan now, in Khartoum especially, is uh, very miserable. As you hear from news, still fighting is continuing. Uh, many deaths, we cannot calculate what's the actual number, uh, even within uh, civilians. And uh, uh, there is a shortage in electricity, there is shortage in water. Although there is a sort of cease of fire, but still there is fire uh, in different areas from time to time. So the general situation is uh, threatening, and we think the, the people of civilians are not feeling safe inside Khartoum these days. What is your own situation? Because we see videos of uh, people trying to flee Khartoum. How are you and your family surviving? Uh, the troops are located inside the civilian cities. This lead that the clashes uh, mediated or the land of war, it will be within the civilians. So many people trying to go out of the city, although the roads itself uh, to reach the, the previous areas are not safe, but it's better than the scenarios in, in order to stay inside home, waiting for death. This is relatively from area to area, definitely, but the general situation is really bad. There are some reports of water and electricity shortages, including even some hospitals being shut down. What can you tell us? Uh, what we can say, the worst scenario now in the medical system Many hospitals are shutting down uh, for different reasons. Shortage in staff, shortage in medical devices and extra. And also, it's not safe in order to operate anything. So in some hospitals, they evacuate the patients from their hospitals. And uh, uh, you cannot find any medical support, or very rarely, in order to find medical support if you are in need for that type of service. There have been international appeals for peace and ceasefire. From your vantage point, Doc, what is the likelihood of a ceasefire and negotiation? Uh, definitely the benefit of the people or civilians to cease fire. This uh, situation uh, is very, as I said, tough and miserable, and they're asking for ceasing fire in order to do. But we think that according to the political situation and to the war itself, that uh, the troops and the war and clashes it continue without what we can say listening for this type of voices. Thank you very much again for speaking with us on Daybreak Africa. We do appreciate highly. You are welcome at any time. Thanks for your considering the show of Sudan. Thank you. That was Mohamed Atmoa speaking with us from the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. 
the Pentagon is positioning military forces near Sudan to help evacuate U.S. embassy personnel in Khartoum if needed amid the explosion of violence between the African country's two warring factions. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other leaders are pushing for a ceasefire until at least Sunday. The U.S. senior diplomatic correspondent Cindy Singh reports from the State Department. The World Health Organization says at least 330 people have been killed and about 3,200 others injured since fighting broke out Saturday between government forces and a paramilitary group in Sudan. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel said the U.S. condemns the violence in the strongest terms and that Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been in contact with both sides and is calling on them to extend the ceasefire until at least Sunday. We're engaging in this um, um, from all corners of the department and continue to have full uh, accountability uh, of our personnel. Um, you saw the Pentagon put out a statement earlier uh, today that uh, through U.S. Africa Command, uh, they are monitoring the situation closely as well and conducting prudent planning for various contingencies. And as they said, they are deploying additional capabilities uh, nearby to the region um, should circumstances require it. At the White House, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said U.S. Embassy staff members are sheltering in place and no decision has been made yet on evacuation. The focus right now is on urging both sides to stop this violence, to abide by a ceasefire, to allow humanitarian aid to get to people that are, uh, that are that need it. I mean, there's already shortages of food. There's concern over shortages of medicine and water. Uh, the situation is dire in Khartoum, uh, and we continue to urge both sides now to stop this violence. This call also came from U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres. I appeal for a ceasefire to take place for at least three days, marking the Eid al-Fitr celebrations to allow civilians trapped in conflict zones to escape and to seek medical treatment, food and other essential supplies. There are estimates of up to 16,000 Americans in Sudan and about 70 U.S. Embassy staff members. The U.S. has some military forces stationed in the neighboring country of Djibouti, which experts say would likely be used for any evacuation operation. After hunkering down indoors since Saturday without electricity, many civilians in Khartoum and the surrounding areas are running out of water and the most basic supplies. With Khartoum's international airport shut down and its border with Chad closed, there are few good options for international aid workers and others to leave. One expert told VOA the Biden administration does not want a repeat of the hasty U.S. departure from Afghanistan. Well, I think we can't uh, sell short the comparison to Afghanistan, especially if we're contemplating um, the visuals of Americans leaving a besieged city when civilians are begging for their own lives, begging uh, to be evacuated along with Americans and international staff. I think that's a terrible optic for the United States to, to be sending uh, in Africa right now. In Port Sudan, some civilians have fled the fighting on foot. Cindy Sain, VOA News, the State Department. South Sudan's petroleum minister says the fighting in Sudan has directly affected oil production in the country. Pew Kang says the fighting has already affected logistics and the transportation of important materials and equipment. He says the few materials available will only sustain production for up to three months, adding that Juba may be forced to shut down oil production if fighting continues for more than three months. Kang says the petroleum ministry has formed an emergency response team that is looking for alternative routes to import needed materials. Mayang David Mayar reports from Juba. South Sudan relies on Sudan for exporting crude oil and imports of raw material for the production of crude oil. Addressing reporters in Juba Thursday, South Sudan's Minister of Petroleum Kang Portchol says South Sudan has few supply of raw materials for the production of crude oil. On behalf of the Ministry of Petroleum and on my own behalf, I would like to reaffirm to the general public and to all concerned citizens of the Republic of South Sudan that the current fighting in the Republic of the Sudan uh, mildly affected the logistics and transportation 
of the critical materials and equipment through Port Sudan to our oil fields in the Republic of South Sudan. Kang says oil companies will continue with oil production for a limited period using some raw materials in their stores. The current inventory of all critical materials, chemicals and equipments in the oil fields are enough to sustain a smooth production and exportation activities of our crude oil for the next three months. And the established emergency response team are tirelessly working with all the stakeholders and their counterparts in the Republic of Sudan to ensure continuous production of crude oil in the Republic of South Sudan despite the ongoing fighting in the Republic of Sudan. The minister says his office and investors have formed an emergency response team to start talks with authorities in Djibouti and Kenya to seek alternative routes for importing raw materials needed for oil production in South Sudan. Joel says pipelines, palm stations, processing facilities and export marine terminal in Sudan are still operating, adding that South Sudan produces up to 169,000 barrels of crude oil per day. For VOA News, I'm a young David Mayer in Juba. As the world marks Earth Day tomorrow Saturday, at least 4.7 billion hectares of forest is lost every year due to human activities. According to the United Nations, human actions are laying waste to forests, jungles, farmland, wetlands, coral reefs, and water bodies, Maureen Ojiambo reports. Earth Day is a moment to encourage the world to live in harmony with nature and the plant as our common home. It is also a day to celebrate, read about, and learn from indigenous people on the front lines of climate action. According to the United Nations, biodiversity is collapsing as one million species, both animals and plants, are threatened with destruction. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says relentless wars on nature must end. That is why we must speed up efforts to deliver climate justice and scale up finance and capacities for adaptation and loss and damage. At the same time, indigenous peoples hold many of the solutions to the climate crisis and are guardians of the world's biodiversity. The so-called green economy is not a new concept for indigenous peoples. It is a way of life stretching back millennia. Let us learn from and embrace the experiences of indigenous peoples worldwide. The loss of biodiversity is said to be accelerated by climate change and many other human factors. The theme of Earth Day this year is invest in our planet. Guterres says there is a need to speed up climate actions as well as scale up investments in adaptation and resilience, particularly for the most vulnerable countries and communities which have done the least to cause the crisis. And I salute indigenous movements across the world, often led by women and young people, for spearheading efforts to protect nature and to preserve biodiversity. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples have pioneered sustainable land management and climate adaption. In the Sahel, ancient farming techniques are breathing life into the semi-arid region. Across the Amazon, indigenous agriculture has preserved and enhanced the richness of the rainforest's ecology. According to the UN, the air we breathe, the water we drink, to the soil that grows our food, humanity's health depends on the health of the planet. With young women all over the world taking the lead on climate action, United Nations Development Program Deputy Resident Representative in Eritrea, Nashida Sattar, highlights the importance of water, especially for women, ahead of Earth Day. Water is so critical for life, and it's great to see this, these great partnerships between the community, the government, the small grants program, GEF, UNDP, and even the AFDB, providing solutions for communities coming together to bring water, be, uh, supporting with check dams, micro dams, uh, terraces, even water harvesting. The United Nations is urging governments and corporations, institutions and civil society to play a vital role in climate change and to make peace with nature. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Maureen Ojiambo in Sacramento, California. Reports say the Burundian government is looking for former Prime Minister Alain Gion Bonyani 
According to Thursday's edition of the New Times of neighboring Rwanda, Bonyani was fired last September after President Ivariste Ndaishemeya warned of a possible coup plot. The publication quotes Burundi's interior minister as saying Bonyani was wanted by the general prosecutor to answer questions about some suspicious cases. Inose Muhozi is the exile director of TV Renaissance. He tells me that there has been tension between Bonyani and President Ndaishemeya because Bonyani also wanted to lead the country. It has been said officially by the Home Affairs Minister that uh, Mr. Alain Guillaume Bunyoni, the former Prime Minister of Burundi, uh, has a, a warrant after him that have been decided by a general prosecutor. Nobody knows officially why, but some uh, news around the members of government and some other of police and army officers, there is an attempt to arrest him but the, it seems that they didn't succeed to arrest him. And some officers, police officers who were known as his close, maybe friends, some of them have been put under investigation. It's the, the situation of the former home intelligence who have been changed, we have, we have been fired. It's the situation of uh, the commander of the anti-riot unity who is under arrest since two days. And it's also said that uh, the home of Mr. Bunyoni, till today, there are policemen there, and that his family, his wife and his children are locked in and cannot get out, neither going to school or going to work for those who work already. You mentioned something about the general prosecutor. I mean, one quote here is that um, Mr. Bunyoni was uh, perhaps wanted because of some cases he might, he might have handled we are not quite sure, but also, at the same time, it, could it be he is connected with uh, the alleged uh, attempted coup that was reported some time back? There are permanent rumors about that. There is a, a quite clear confrontation or misunderstanding uh, or difference of, of uh, opinion between General Bunyoni and the current president, Mr. Evariste de Chimie. Each one pretending to be the legitimate one to be the, the head of state of Burundi. So... There's a kind of, till, day, uh, till, till this moment, it was uh, not said by any of them officially, but there's a lot of tension between these two people because Mr. Bunyoni also, also wanted to be president of Burundi. So there's a permanent kind of uh, confrontation between them, even if none of them say it loudly. But everybody knows that there is a kind of competition between them to be the, the head of the country. What's going on? We thought by now Burundi was returning to some stability. There is no way there can be stability because there is a lot of competition between the, the main personality of the, the, the ruling party, between themselves, but there is also a lot of problems going on in the country. A lot of people claiming to be jobless, hungry. Innocent Muhozi is the exile director of TV Renaissance in Burundi. He was speaking with us from Perugia, Italy, where he's attending the International Journalism Festival. Several communities across Liberia's capital, Monrovia, and its environs report that scores of young people have died and continue to be affected by the use of kush, an illicit form of the indica strain of uh, cannabis. It is estimated that two in ten youth in Liberia are into the use of illicit substances. Denise Nipson has more from Monrovia. The lifeless bodies of several young people were recently discovered in areas in and around the capital, including Soniwen, Nuku Town, and Broville. They all died from smoking, drinking, or injecting kush, which has been mixed with other toxic substances. Scores of women on on the Batner concerned women of Soniwen talk to the streets and also told the executive mansion to draw government attention to what they consider to be a threat to Liberian youth. The chairwoman of the group, Lovina Kranga, says the lives of their children are threatened because the situation has no control. The drug dealer, especially in our community here, there is no control. They are all over the place. They don't have one place to sell their drugs. Personally, as I speak, around the public school, when you go there, they have their small, small boot. They are always seeing your children for water. They will see their children go to school when they can't also to buy their color, to buy their candy. They will see them. So the only thing they see in the community is just. 
and some of them they are influenced by their friends in such a situation many people want the relevant authorities to take control of the matter manakranka who is angry says the liberia jock enforcement agency is the appropriate agency to tackle the problem the dea that we have what is their function and they cannot work what the government paying them for what the, are the agencies say in existing what are they doing are they there to only eat money so, Mr. they are even increasing the problem. We are calling on to our president, our representative, our senator. Let them come in to take action. Sophia King, a member of the Sony Way community, has to live and care for three children of her brother who died from using the drug. President George Weah last year launched a national fund of over 13 million United States dollars for the rehabilitation and empowerment of at risk youth. The Minister of Youth and Sports, Zilga Wilson, was not available for comment on the project. Reporting for VOA's Daybreak Africa, I'm Denise Nipson in Monrovia, Liberia.